Hi, everyone. I'm so honored, actually, to have with us Naomi Aldort, who is the author of a book that is near and dear to my heart. It's called Raising Our Children, Raising Ourselves. I'm so happy and honored to have you with us. You know, I first uh, got your book many years ago. I have a son, 17, and when he was very young, I was in a bookstore looking for parenting books and I saw the title and it was the title that just practically had that book jump off of the shelf to me. I just, I love the title, Raising Our Children, Raising Ourselves. So welcome, welcome. I'm happy to have you. Thank you for having me, yeah. Susie. Beautiful. It's, it's wonderful being here. Beautiful. Well, I'd love to just jump right in and have you just share with us the heart of the philosophy of your book, Raising Our Children, Raising Ourselves. You know, it's obvious by the title, like you say, that raising our children is about raising ourselves. But I think in the beginning of the book, there is a quote by um, uh, Khalil Gibran's lover, Mary Haskell. And in a way, it sums up the whole book in terms of the philosophy. And it says, uh, nothing you become will disappoint me. I have no preconceptions that I'd like to see you be or do. I have no desire to foresee you, only to discover you. Mm. And in a way, when you ask me, you know, who can sum up their whole philosophy? But I think Mary Haskell summed up my philosophy as good as it gets, but I'll say just a few more words. So it's really about getting our ego out of the way. This child isn't ours. So another quote that I have at the end of the book, I have Khalil Gibran's poem on the children. Your children are not your children. They are sons and daughters of life longing for itself. And that is the bottom line of being curious about who this is, who is this being that came into my life and not owning it. You're not the boss. You're not to turn them into something. You respect creation. You nurture, you water the flower so it'll bloom, not if it'll bloom. It's one of the quotes in my book. There's the cat talking. <laughs> uh, and nurture who the child is, is not shaping and deciding who they should be, what they should learn, what they will achieve. And you do it through respecting creation and connecting with who the child is so that the child can dance in the rain, but dance who he or she is, their own dance, not what you think. So there is so much power in that because it allows us to grow ourselves. And that's the best gift we can give to children. And, you know, I work with parents who are mostly attachment parents who are trying exactly that, who are saying they want to listen to the baby, do what the baby wants, nurse on demand, sleep with the baby, respond to the baby. But it seems like as soon as the baby is a toddler, a lot of the time our egos get in the way and we start getting in conflict because we're wanting something specific, even just wanting the child to be happy. Uh, but that gets in the way. And it actually starts even with infants. When we design how and when they should sleep, we get in the way of their wisdom of when to sleep, which is not necessarily when we think they should sleep, although we do need to make the conditions such that they enable the baby's discovery of their need to sleep and so they can go to sleep. We don't need to control it and decide and put them to sleep. I have three sons. I've never put a child to sleep in my life. Mm -hmm. I've put packages in drawers. I've put dishes in cabinets. I have not put a child to sleep. That's none of my business, the sleep of the child. As a result, my three sons are very deep sleepers, never had problems sleeping, and, and have been very self-directed because they learn. 
And that's another essence of what I teach. How I feel inside is right. Because what I teach in raising our children, raising ourselves in, through my private sessions on Skype with people and family intensives and workshops is find out, be curious about the child, find out who they are, what they need, make sure the message they get from you is, dear child, how you feel inside is right. Mm. So when they want to sleep with me, they're not becoming dependent because of wanting to sleep with me. They're becoming independent in following their own decision where they should sleep. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. I, I'm, you're speaking my language. Um, so that brings me to the question then, how do you work with parents who experience their own anxiety around things which, which you are talking about yeah. and their children's anxiety simultaneously? How do you work with each and both of them then? Well, let me first say that a parent anxiety when it comes to safety, well-being, health, some of it is unavoidable, okay? We, we can be in charge of our own body. It feels pretty good and easy. We know what we feel. All of a sudden, our heart is walking on somebody else's legs, and we have no control, and we don't fully know what's going on there. And the world looks dangerous, the influences the, in their teenagers, the drugs, when they're babies, you know, what's going on inside, are they healthy? So I am not illusioning any parent by saying, oh, you can be a parent completely free of anxiety. That's just not available. But there is another part of anxiety that has to do with what I said about my philosophy that has to do with being fixated on shaping the child and wanting the child to look a certain way. And the raising our self part there is to let go of seeking approval because it all has to do with fitting in, looking good in the eyes of the relatives, of the partner, of the mother and father, of the society, of what will others say, is my child a good child? And when we seek approval, we're insecure and anxious guaranteed. So now we're going around, oh, what would mother-in-law say? Should I do this? Should I do that? What would my friend say? Is that the right thing? And we're not actually aware of the child and being present to the child and what's going on for them because the answer is in the child. The answer is in noticing who this person is in that curiosity. We're also, as far as the child anxiety, we're training the child to be anxious, starting at babyhood in this society, by training them to want all the time, like have now, be happy all the time. You know, don't cry, here, we'll fix it, we'll fix it. Oh, this broke here, I'll give you another one, I'll fix it. So anxiety on, others, on our side is seeking approval. Anxiety on the child's side is teaching them to want things and also to seek approval, and also teaching the child that love is conditional. So when we start praising, good job, good job, wonderful, now the child becomes anxious. When I do it again, will I do it as good that daddy will jump and say good job again? Will I elicit that same result? I'm supposed to get this, all this praise, all these kudos. So when the love is conditional and we may not think that's love, that's just evaluation, but evaluation is for the child connected to being loved, mm -hmm. being worthy. And we don't want to evaluate or to praise. So that's one of the things that I teach. And I teach how instead to create connection that encourages rather than an evaluation that discourages or that creates dependency on approval, mm -hmm. i.e. anxiety. So we want to not react to how the child is, but discover the child and respond to who she is. The child is right. The child has a valid reason for what they do. And we are looking for what is it and how can I meet the need? And if we're anxious ourselves, it's very, very hard to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the child, it's mostly avoidable 
if we work on ourselves. So for example, actually just two days ago, I had a 10 years old girl in the session with her mother. Usually I counsel on Skype or Zoom the parent from all over the world. But sometimes the parent would bring a child who is old enough, who was willing to talk to me. The child was upset because the day before she and her friend swapped toys. And she ended up with toys she got very excited about. Well, the next day, the mother of the other girl was upset and forced them to swap back. Mm. So the girl said this was unfair and she was stuck in a lot of misery and anxiety about how come I'm not getting what I want. And I used the, the work similar to the work of Byron Katie. Yes. Uh, and children do it very, very fast. And this child was no exception. <laughs> You know, like when I ask her, you know, when you believe the thought that life should be fair, uh, and then specifically, we also did when you believe the thought that the uh, toys shouldn't have been swapped back, what do you feel? And it's stress and anger and upset and upset with the mother of the child and all this unfairness. And how would you be without this thought? Because it's only a thought. Without it, we're just in reality, in the present without all these stories that it's supposed to be this way and this way. And she said, oh, I would be just fine with the swapping back. Exactly. Exactly. So the truth is it should have been swapped back because that's what it was. It's like the rain, like the wind. We don't say it shouldn't be windy now. I should be able to go to the beach without losing my hat. Right. Don't say it shouldn't rain now. I should be able to go without an umbrella or to go at all. We understand it's raining. We accept it. We don't go to war against it. But for some reason, we believe that human behavior is something to go against. Yes. That it's not reality. But once we realize it's reality, the other person is the tsunami. It's the wind. It's reality to flow with. To That's the next thing that happens. Love that one. Yes. Yeah. And that actually brings me to another question because you speak a lot about cultivating and acquiring silence and self-discipline and, and raising really powerful humans. So what you're speaking of in that session is, you know, why could you share with us why you believe that allowing a child to fail and to flounder, as, as you were saying, is so important uh, to assist them to achieve, you know, such resilience and well, how could a parent begin to practice that with their child? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we have taken to extreme making our children happy. And ultimately, we're teaching them that life has to be wonderful all the time. And a child whose every problem is fixed and life is wonderful all the time, of course, has no muscle for adversity. Right. So <laughs> he can't dance in the rain. He's just running away from the storm all the time. Oh, oh let's run away. Let's fix so I'll give you a story because this is true for teenagers, for babies, for toddlers. So I remember uh, my third child. I'm looking out the window right here, actually. We had a huge porch. Now we have something else, but it doesn't matter. And he was on his tricycle. It was about one and a half or two years old or, you know, around that. And he fell and the tricycle fell on him and initially he burst out with a scream. Of course, I looked to see that it didn't look like anything serious happened. But I didn't make myself visible. Mm -hmm. I didn't come out and say, are you all right? I didn't give him the idea that something could be wrong. Instead, I observed. Okay. And then he looked around to see if anybody reacted, if anybody thought that something bad happened. And when he saw that nobody's excited at all, he pushed the tricycle, he got up, got back on, and walked. Exactly. Actually, I remember with another child, the same thing with walking. The first few steps, you know, it takes them a few days to learn to walk. But, you know, when they fall, they kind of look around, and I just smile back. Like, it's all right. You know, there's no failing in life. There is just different things happening. Failing or succeeding is labels that the human mind adds, interpretation, evaluation. But a fallen child is not a failure, is not something bad. 
it's just what happened next. And a get up and walk again child is that. And a scraped knee is something maybe to put a Band-Aid on. It's not a problem. It's not a disaster. And we need, I remember also in a birthday party once, when a bunch of kids were in those, you know, those wagons, they're usually red mm -hmm. that somebody can pull. And like, I think five or seven kids got on the wagon and two kids were pulling them and they got to this rocky place that goes down the hill, didn't evaluate it correctly. The whole thing spilled. All the children went on the floor. None of them were crying except for one girl whose mother ran over with panic and picked her up. Oh no, oh no. So that child burst out crying. Yes. So, so we did teach them how to react to the storm, how to react to falls, how to react to things happening however they're happening. We teach them to call it a failure or to just say, oh, this one turned out this way. Exactly. And the child may say, well, but I really wanted it to be this way. I say, well, you can try another one. Exactly. And to realize that the joy of life is in a process, not in looking for an outcome. Only an outcome can be defined by the human mind as a failure or success. Even the concept outcome is a human mind invention. Okay. There is none. There is no outcome. You know, the tree growing in nature is not an outcome of the seed falling in and becoming a tree. Yes. We call it an outcome. It's not right if it becomes a tree and wrong if it got dug by a, you know, a cat who was, you know, doing his thing there and yes. <laughs> digging it out. It's just this way or that way. Yes. And the other thing that causes, uh, um, that gets people powerful is not being afraid, and that's the same as the parents, wanting to please all the time. So I teach not to praise and not to foster an attitude of competition. So good job, good boy, good girl, out the window. I definitely teach not to do that. Uh, we played games non-competitively, even if the board game was designed competitive. We found a way to do it non-competitive. The kids didn't know, you know, they'd be competitive. No fixing, no praising, no seeking yourself as a parent, the approval of someone else about how your child behaves. Yes. You know, your child goes around and maybe, you know, my um, oldest child used to go in restaurants from table to table and talk to people. And people say, oh, you let him do that? What if he disturbs them? That's between him and them. Exactly. But some people wouldn't dare to tell him. I said, well, that's their problem. They can go to their therapist and learn some <laughs> assertiveness. Exactly. It's not my business. And my child is learning. And he goes and some tables are enchanted with him and listen for five minutes and then tell him, you know, we have a romantic dinner, go somewhere else. Some of them listen for a long time. And some tell him right away, get lost. And some of them, you know, pretend and suffer. Well... <laughs> That's real life. He's experiencing real life. And those people who tell him, we don't want to listen to you right now, that's real life. I don't need to rescue them from reality. And I don't need to rescue him from reality. Right. So I let life unfold and that's power. Right. Because I'm not teaching to seek approval, to want anything. I don't have a problem with tantrums, but I don't cause them. You know, some people confuse not having tantrums with causing them. Also, I can tell my child, absolutely not. Here, give this back to me. And the child bursts out crying. I say, well, could you let him have it? I mean, start with generosity. I'm not saying to go and torment the kids so they can experience failure or experience a tantrum. But if they fell or another child was first on the swing and they're throwing themselves on the ground and say, oh, I just went to the bathroom and now the, the swing is taken. Well, that's reality. Now the swing is taken. Or the example of children sometimes coming to you and say they won't play with me. They told me to leave the room and not to play. I always teach parents and say to the child, okay, what would you like to do instead? That's making powerful people because you're teaching them you can handle that they don't play with you. 
I'm not going back inside and telling them to include everybody and all this beautiful lecture. I'm not fixing your situation. I'm showing you, yeah, I got it. So nobody's playing with you. Would you like me to read you a book? Yes. Would you like to help me in the kitchen? I'm making lunch for everybody. And if they already have an emotion because we taught them for everything yes. to go their way, then I validate the feeling. I, I would say kindly, would you like to tell me more? You really wanted to play with them and, and they don't want to play with you. Would you like to tell me the whole story? Would you like to tell me how you feel? And I listen, but I don't evaluate. I don't moralize and I don't take away the sting. It's like, yeah, that can hurt. You really yeah. wanted to play with them and you're disappointed. Yes. And when they do that, they get over it. And when they get over it, usually you don't even have to say, what would you like to do instead? Because then they say, well, can I do this with you? Or would you call my mother? Let's say it's a friend visiting and have her pick me up because now I'm bored. And say, yeah, absolutely. Exactly. You can do that. Exactly. And I think in where we're finding ourselves in this particular time in history, you know, I think what you're saying, because our children are so looking to us to see how are we responding. So yeah. they're always looking at us. So I think what I'm hearing you say is that it does start with our, our own parental inner work so that we can become more comfortable allowing life to happen both to us and to our children so they feel that from us you know and that we become worthy of imitating because we are being imitated and if we are falling apart when we don't get approval that's going to be imitated exactly correct which is why i bought your book because i knew intuitively this young being was going to be looking to me just to a sentient being to to feel where am I at not necessarily what I'm saying but to feel me and yes. so what you're saying exactly to be worthy of being imitated is beautiful yes and to not drown with the child's emotion right. but to be the rock that they can lean on and they right. can see themselves in you as I right. can handle life the way it goes right. I can handle life the way it goes, therefore you can handle life the way it goes, you yeah. know. And that brings me to another question. I love this part of your work where you talk about, you know, creating your home environment so that your child is not fearing you, but wants to be in cooperation. And I'm, I'm just wondering if you could elaborate and share a little bit about that. Well, kind of the whole book is about that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but um, let me just remind myself um, of um, maybe an example. But it is about leadership. So in the young child, it's about baby proofing, right? It's like so that you don't have to say no. You want, you want to be a leader, but you don't want to be the obstruction of your child's life. Mm -hmm. So so that they see life as going in harmony with who they are, then they want to cooperate, they want to be with you. Um, and you set life up so you don't go to a restaurant when a child needs movement. You don't go and ask the child to be quiet because you want to visit with friends. If you have visitors, make sure your child has visitors too or a babysitter or some, some way to be engaged. So they're not your babysitter waiting for you to have fun with your guests. So, <laughs> and question your own trigger thoughts that he should be quiet. He should understand that I want to visit with my friends now. She should listen to me. Uh, she should go to bed when I say go to bed. Uh, all these thoughts are simply not true because right. they lack the awareness of where is the child and what do they want, Yes. right? So yes. when, when we actually are in harmony with reality and we come back to this observing of, of the child, um, one of the biggest use of language that is bossy and controlling and creates the illusion of defiance is it's time to. It's a, it's a dirty trick that we learned innocently. Nobody should feel guilty about any of this. 
but when we don't say, we, we fool ourselves to think, I'm not saying I'm forcing you to go to bed now. I'm not saying I'm not forcing you to leave the playground now. It's time to go. It's time for dinner. It's time for bed. And I always say, who is this God of it's? You know, it's, it's a lousy excuse to blame it's on the fact that we're being bossy. <laughs> So, and the example I always give, like what, what I recommend to do with children, what I did with my own, when a child, you know, for some reason you want to go home or maybe the big brother or sister want to go home and one child wants to stay. I remember when I did that, when two of the children wanted to go home from a playground and the three years old was just nuts about sliding on and on and on. And I just said to him, your brothers would like to go home. They want to play Monopoly and are hungry. How many more times do you need to slide? And he felt ownership. It's like, I'm not telling him, I'm not bossing him around. Okay, time to go five more times. I'm asking him, I'm letting him be in charge of life, have compassion toward others and what they want, counting on him to care that his brothers want to go by saying it and taking it for granted. And then he said 10 more times. And after five, he was already thinking about what he would do with his brothers and watching them playing Monopoly, got excited and said, okay, I had enough. But <laughs> the thing is that also along the way, I like to teach parents to be aware of other people. Let's guess what this baby is wanting. Let's guess dad's feeling when he comes home. Do you think he's going to be hungry? Or if somebody is upset, do you know why he's upset? Can we guess? Let's ask him. Why is he behaving this way? You know, being aware of other people uh, rather than all the time about oneself. And, you know, the, the strength is also allowing children to feel cold. You know, it's healthier to be a little cold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, today we're just dressing children because we're cold. Yeah. We're not noticing the child. Let them go barefoot in the snow, like uh, Dr. Weston Price discovered healthy children in natural societies do all the time. Yes. And, and some athletes now teach us that that's yes. the way they get themselves healthy. Exactly. Like this, this Dutch uh, man, uh, Wim Hof, his name, I think. Yes. Uh, so, so because now we're talking about how to strengthen the immune system. Well, let it practice and creating heat in the body is the way it practices. We made ourselves weak, not only emotionally, yes. by teaching a child to want things all the time and to have entertainment all the time and to make every food so yummy instead of just eating food the way it is, making entertainment out of everything. We also teach children to be comfortable all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, the temperature in the house is between 70 and 71. I mean, like we have no ability like other animals or like we used to have to so be yeah. able to play in the hot, yeah. in, in yeah. the sun when it's hot and in the snow without having to put layers and layers and layers. They can do it. A lot of children go out without a coat and you see the mother running after them and putting a coat on them and they don't even want it. Why ruin their ability to handle the cold? Their, their little body is... It's the same mechanism as the immune system is working out. It's getting yes. exercise. Yes. I, I think I diverted with from well, your No, it's perfect. It's leading me to this other with every with every explanation you share, it leads me to another part of your work, which kind of it kind of goes back to the anxiety question, but I find this with the parents I work with is often there just seems to be such a struggle and I think you're speaking to it about really it starts with the parental anxiety when we have things around bedtime and dinner time and brushing right. your teeth and how do you work with the parents part of the anxiety when a parent is so um, most most parents are either inundated or convinced that that it needs to be a certain way so it just creates so much anxiety right right so I work with parents every day on Skype. And what I do with them is a process of inquiring into their thoughts. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. It's similar to the work of Byron Katie, mm -hmm. although it's my own brand of it mm -hmm. to some degree because it's specifically on parenting, but it's in essence the same. Looking at what causes anxiety. My child should be able to do that. A lot of the trend right now that gives parents anxiety is achievement. Mm -hmm. Every parent wants their child to be the next doctor or pianist or sportsman, you know, like look on YouTube videos and you'll see anxiety. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. like all these super kids doing super things and I go like, oh my God. Uh, who is behind this kid uh, and what kind of anxiety behind it. So I like to stress, and it comes back to what we spoke about originally, to be observing the child and responding to who they are without an agenda, without pushing them to succeed and to achieve through praise and prices or any, or any of that stuff. Um, but with the parents themselves, when they're anxious, I definitely have them write down the, their anxious thoughts. Yes. I'm worried that the child would be this and that. Uh, he would never be able to listen. He would never learn to read. He would never stop hitting his brother or sister. Nobody would like him. Whatever the thought is, they write it down. And I go through the whole process with them. First of all, is that true? And can you really know that it would never go away or that whatever, whatever they have in mind, you know, he's a bad kid, he's hitting his brother, he's hitting his brother for a good reason. And when you realize he should hit his brother, which doesn't mean you let him do that. Right. But it means that the drive to want to do that it comes from a real and valid reason, then you put yourself on the correct path. You were on the wrong path of just obstructing the child, yes. creating struggle and anxiety, and you can still stop them from hitting, but with no anger, with total compassion. And now mm -hmm. you're wondering, so the, when you write down the thought, he shouldn't be hitting his brother, you go like, okay, so he does have a valid reason to hit his brother. And I would ask the parent when I work with them, so give me three good reasons why he has a good reason to do it. Yeah. Jealousy, he took his toys away, he always plays with the friends that come to visit him, he takes his attention away from mommy and daddy, whatever it is, there is always a huge list, right? So now you realize all of that, you have compassion, you have understanding, and because you know what the problem is, you can do something about it. Yeah. Maybe he shouldn't spend as much time together. Maybe we yes. need to hire a babysitter for the brother and go on an outing both parents and this child so he feels he has two parents again once in a while. Maybe this, maybe that. Maybe we should lock his toys and his creations so his brother doesn't get to it and ruins everything he does. So when you start looking at that the child is right, when you turn the thought that thinks something is wrong with the child, backward, you realize what is the valid reason for the child and you realize that your own thinking was misleading you. Exactly, exactly. So, so that's kind of in a short way. I do a lot more. I also provide parents with healing games that I invent, mm -hmm. uh, kind of custom made. They tell me what's going on and I would invent some family games or something a parent can do with the child with dolls or with a ball or with nothing, just with themselves, uh, playing specific games that are healing, that create, bring the problem out and give the child a practice of getting out of a pattern that isn't working for them and that hurting them inside. Um, and that's often healing for the parent just as much. Well, exactly correct, right? Because yes. when we're, when we're, one person can't heal basically without both people healing. So, yes. and I think it's so beautiful your work because children learn through play and yes. we heal through play, you know, so it's lovely. And I, I will certainly be sharing where everybody can, can find you because I think in our culture, we are so disconnected from our own ability to be healers and to have your guidance 
and do it through a method of play and through a way that a child can embrace it is invaluable, you know? And it's a family game. So a lot of them yeah. are group games you can do with other people. I teach them in workshops and in private sessions. I just make them up for the parent yeah. child. Yeah. Or people come here for family intensive, like they come to mm -hmm. my home. I have an apartment in the yard. It's very beautiful. Mm -hmm here for a few days mm -hmm. and we invent games on the spot that Phenomenal. really punch the anxiety, the dependency on approval, uh, anger, uh, upset, jealousy, all these things uh, can get healed by exposing them and playing with them and training oneself through play mm -hmm. to have other muscles. Exactly. And I think, you know, parents are just needing this permission to not go with the mainstream. You know, I know I had that. My son was in a Waldorf school when he was little and people consistently were like, what do you mean you haven't taught him to read yet? What's going to happen to him? You know, and there is a lot of fear that we are inundated with. So to mm -hmm. have people and, and teachers and guides that we are um, aligned with that yeah. can assist us to feel empowered from the inside out Yes. And to know, of course, our own deepest intuition, if we get still enough, knows that a child is curious. That's the, that's the characteristic of childhood is they're curious. Of course, they're going to learn to read if you, you know, so. You can't stop them. You can't even stop them. Exactly. Not so. only that, it's much easier to learn to read than to learn to talk. And that they figure out at age two exactly. or so, between exactly. two and five. Uh, but I find that it's very advantageous to learn to read as late as possible. Yeah. Because while not reading, and this is my own thinking, just an opinion and observation, mm -hmm. while not reading, the child develops phenomenal memory. Yes. And phenomenal yes. imagination. Yes. Yes. You know, that's why you read them books and they know them by heart. Exactly correct. And they're not dependent on the visuals. So other senses stay just as sharp. And children have all kinds of senses we're not quite sure what they are. Yes. They seem to be connected in ways that we lose as we get older. And the later we get them into this yes. conceptual tool yes. of reading, I, I think the better. I mean, my children didn't go to school and taught themselves to read each in their own method. Yes. And they invented the method, which is more important than the reading itself. Yes. Uh, yeah. Not only they felt empowered, but the brain learned to figure out, you know, what are the symbols meaning and to invent a way to figure it out. Yes. Uh, and to master it, which is a lot better than yes. having some method that teaches it to you on a certain age. And of course, they learned in a time that was fitting their eye development, yes. perceptual development, concepts of right and left development. There's so many things, you know, then people label them dyslexic. They're not dyslexic. Yeah. They're normal. Every child doesn't see yeah. a difference between something facing this way and this way. You know, mommy facing left or right is still mommy. A dog facing left or right is still a dog. A chair facing this way or that way is still a chair. Why would a symbol of a certain shape become something else when it faces the other way? It makes no sense. So for a child to come to a place understanding symbols and drawing, the brain of each child gets there in a different time. Just and so it has to coordinate with everything else. And if we force it at a time that it doesn't have it, then we say, oh, the child is dyslexic. They don't see, they don't understand, they confuse the sides. No, they don't confuse the sides. They don't go through the wall when they see a door here. <laughs> they, you know, exactly. they, they see where the tail of the dog is and where the head is. They don't think the face is here, exactly. you know, when, when it is here. So it, it's just that they don't have that particular frontal lobe development. Yes. And yes. when you wait until, and the child himself knows best when he got all the ducks in a row, and then they figure out reading often overnight. Yeah, that, that was exactly my son. You're reminding me. My son used to um, play animal school, and it was before he was even in school, but he, he lined up all his stuffed animals. And you know, before he learned to read, he created his own language. 
Yes. And you're just reminding me of it. It was very, very intricate with these different symbols. And yes. He would draw the different symbols and he would tell me exactly. So he created it and then he somehow in his own way morphed into these symbols, you know. But yes. he had a whole language that was his and he completely understood this language, you know. Yes. Exactly. Was, and I haven't thought about that in so many years. Yeah, and they invent math. And they exactly. invent ways to solve problems and numbers. Yeah, exactly. And then they understand it so much better. You know, one of my sons at age seven or so, he loved numbers and he would add giant numbers like millions, but he would add them from left to right. He wrote them one under the other mm -hmm. and added the digits from left to right. And I didn't know how he could do it because what about the extras, right? And in school, you just learn automatically to do it from right to left, to take the extras right. and move them around. Right. And you never fully understand it until maybe you're an adult and a lot of adults don't understand it. Right. So I didn't correct him. I just asked him to explain to me how come he got it right. What did he do with the extras? Yeah. And he gave me a whole lecture, which he understood it better than me. That's phenomenal. Because he just because it came from the inside out of him. Yeah, he yeah. found a way. He said, "I know there is this extras, but at about this and this, this I I can see." And I, you know, he had some method to figure it out because he never made a mistake. That's phenomenal. That that's exquisite. Well, I could sit here and talk to you all day. I would just end with just I'm so grateful. Um, I just end with this one question that you're pretty much leading into which is, I know in your philosophy, you really believe that innately within each child, they're capable of their own autonomy, of their own happiness, you know? So just to maybe share in closing with everyone, elaborating on that would be a great place to, to complete. When you look at a toddler, they're happy to be here. They're enlightened, but they're not because they're not conscious of themselves, right? Yeah. Um, so they're happy to be here and we do a great job sometimes of killing that happiness. So most of my answer is what not to do. So yes. if we stop teaching them that joy means you have to want something and get something and jingle something in front of your face or make the food a certain way or get gifts and material goods or that the circumstances outside of you cause your happiness. Oh, you're going to get that. You're going to be so happy. Um, or you model that. Or you teach them to seek approval. Let's see if grandma likes what you're doing. Sing her that song. Wow, wonderful. Now you're teaching them to get away from this unconditional innate happiness. You seem to mm -hmm. want things, to depend on getting something all the time, mm -hmm. being entertained all the time, seeking approval and seeking stimulation and gratification and comfort. So when they express their exuberance, which often mm -hmm. parents stop that exuberance, the child jumps up and down and jumps mm -hmm. on the couch. Don't go on the couch. Don't touch this. Don't touch this. Mm -hmm. So that ties together to the other question you ask of, making the circumstances that mm -hmm. allows them freedom. I'm not saying to let them dance on the table or on grandma's uh, couch. I think children who are generally free are totally responsive and cooperative with boundaries. Mm -hmm. And I found that in my children and in a lot of children who raise their children this way are actually the best behaving children. Mm -hmm. So when people say, oh, then the children will go and do all these things. No, they don't. Because when they experience you on their side, opening the doors for them, but also leading with clarity, we're going to a concert. We have to sit silently here. So if you need something, you give me a sign language. And I did that with my children who went to classical music concerts from age three say, you know, we go to a concert that you're familiar with, we sit on the aisle, when you just can't stand it anymore, you peed before you ate, you know, everything perfect, you want to leave, you give me a single, as soon as clapping hands, we sneak out. You know what your power is, you know the rule of the game. So actually, you know, and I got compliments for my children every single time going to restaurants. It's like a joke. It's like, okay, somebody's going to come to the table and say, 
oh my goodness, your children behave so well. What do you do? It's, it's what I don't do. I'm not telling them how to behave. I just made sure they played in the playground for three hours before coming here. And that we came to a restaurant that has a playground to play while the food is being prepared. And that they want to be here and they're hungry and they chose food and it's healthy food, whatever, whatever. So the situations are flowing with the river, not being their oppressor and not teaching them that they must have what they want all the time on the one hand mm -hmm. and yet flowing with life as much as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, letting them fall off the tricycle, not praising mm -hmm. them, not mm -hmm. manipulating them. Mm -hmm. uh, letting them have autonomy, but also teaching them to be considerate of others by leading the way. No, we can't go to grandma now, she's asleep. Mm -hmm. Or we need to be quiet. My children would play for hours and let me take a nap, mm -hmm. you know, from a certain age on. But m whoever was the youngest, by age two, they could sit next to me on the floor with some pieces of apple and some blocks and puzzles and I could give a session or do an interview like this mm -hmm. and they wouldn't pip unless they have to go to the bathroom in which case I would interrupt and, and help them but they would sit for a full hour never interrupting yes. they understood that the other person exists which sometimes and that's a whole other subject for another interview <laughs> mm -hmm. how we make our children have power over us instead right. of over themselves. Yeah. So I'm talking about autonomy, not about power, power over people, because with true leadership, your children learn how life is conducted and they behave well because they want to of their own free will, because they have a partner, you. Yeah. You're not the oppressor. You're going with them on the path. This is what we do here in order to flow. Yes, because there's something innately that feels so good about being part of something you yes. know and so when the parent is in the flow and i think that's that's what it is 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 for the parent to find the flow and when well, they find this child yes through, through all of the different things that you said for instance going out to eat making sure that your child has played for three hours in the park or played before they come they're hungry you're going to a place that they're going to all of those things but when you create that flow yes but Susie let me just point out because I don't want parents to listen to it and start feeling guilty right this to be able to do that like I can hear the voices but I can't do that I, I, I go unconscious I don't notice I get angry that's all part of work on yourself that's why I give sessions that's why there are books and seminars and web classes that I do or I come and do workshops in different um, communities or via the internet uh, as long as we have viruses around that we're freaking out about um, and to to work on yourself to work on what it is that's being triggered so right. what it is emotionally that gets in your way inside of you right. in your way of being present and notice oh the child needs to play a couple of hours before they're seated they need to sit in a restaurant they're excited about and that they need to be hungry and want to be there so that we go as a family to the restaurant we're all excited we decided like equal people like, yes, we want to go here. This is wonderful. We're all yeah. wonderful. It's not that I'm dragging my kids into my life. It's like we have a life together. And yeah, parents sometimes need their life and hire a babysitter. Or like I said, I can give a session. I have my life. And I would say to my kids, you can play in the other room or you can be with your dad or you can be right here silently. And they do either one of those with total understanding because life wasn't focused on them, which is another subject sometimes to cover. From babyhood on, I think parents today are focused on the child too much, especially in those early years. So the child is used to so much, you know, adoration and stimulation and everything is about her. Yeah. And we actually want to raise children who are born into a community that flows and that they're just joining the river. Yes. They are not the center. 
Yes, they're joining the river. They are joining a community. They notice what other people do, what other people do with other people. That's part of why they behave well, because it's not about them getting whatever they want. Right. It's them observing, how is this river flowing? I need to go around this stone in order to stay together with everybody. Yes. So... Well, the, I the love the importance that you... of community. So people like with the first child, I always tell them, make sure to be around other people, family, mm -hmm. friends, relatives, with other children, with other adults, and just make sure the child is not the focus in, in their experience, mm -hmm. like all about them and them getting what they want and life being this perfect, happy-go-lucky. Yes. And I think what you're saying, it, it is such an enormous amount of work. It was for me to find my flow. And um, I would love for you to share with everyone where they can find you, because I'm sure there are going to be many people who would like to be able to work with you one-on-one -on -one or do one of your family retreats. Yeah, and, and that, that's the best. Those who come to family intensive, they transform their lives. Mm. They come for a few days here, and I hear for years, I just get emails from them or mm -hmm. a session every now and then, like, you know, they really get their life out of it. But you can achieve a lot just by private sessions mm -hmm. like this. Uh, people talk to me on Skype, um, and they can reach me at my website, naomialdor.com, uh, also authenticparent.com, not authentic parenting, that's something else, uh, not even similar but authenticparent.com, authenticchild.com, all will get you to the same place. Um, and there are videos there, there are articles, and there is Call Naomi, a link that shows how to call me. There is Family Retreat, which shows you how to create for yourself a private workshop for your family uh, or extended family. There, I'm very flexible. Sometimes people like to bring grandparents or whatever with. Mm -hmm. And they're grandparents who come sometimes to big workshops. And, and I public speak, so that's available too. People can organize for their community, either long distance, uh, on screen, or, or in person, depending if the finances allow that, if it's not so far. Um, but I go to Europe and Australia, and you know I go places. But recently, I'm trying to not pollute with flights, and I'm also mm -hmm. getting older. Mm -hmm. So there are uh, web classes coming up in Spain, which would be translated in English, mm -hmm. and Switzerland and Slovakia. So those will be both online and um, people will be in a, in a group, but mm -hmm. other people will be able to join in. I mean, depending on these rules with the the virus exactly. ruling us. <laughs> exactly. Well, either way, you can be online and we can find you online. Yes. And yes. I, I will obviously have all of your information. So don't worry if you didn't hear it. Everything will be printed right below this so everyone can find you really, really easily. Right. But you are a wealth, just a wealth of not only information and wisdom, but really that richness that you can just feel the possibility of a deeper connection with you know parent child and that's what we're all looking for so thank you so very very much i'm very grateful and appreciative of your time thank you susie i appreciate right. you doing this yeah so until next time yes excellent thank you everyone